And welcome to Pelican Harbor Seabird Station, where we are rescuing Miami's native wildlife since 1980. It's 42 years, quite a bit of time. And I love our mission of Pelican Harbor. Uh, we're dedicated to the rescue, rehabilitation, and release of sick, injured, and orphaned brown pelicans, seabirds, and other native wildlife, and the preservation and protection of these species through education, educational and scientific means. Well, today we're doing one of these educational. And our vision is so critical to me when I look at key words there, professionalism, compassion, integrity, the compassion that our staff and volunteers have. Uh, comparing when I worked at Fairchild where our incredible volunteers work with orchids, butterflies, and walk through our rainforest, our volunteers here clean bird poop and fish, you know, and throw fish, you know, to the birds and prepare meals. But the integrity and professionalism with which it's done, it is amazing. So thank you all. And today we're going to be talking about attracting native wildlife to your yard. Once again, my name is Kiki Mutis, and I am the operations and volunteer manager at the Seabird Station. And click, click. Okay. So to attract wildlife, I need to move this one second. Thank you. When you're planting plants, you need to think about putting stuff there for all stages of development. This is critical when you're talking about butterflies because a butterfly larva, the caterpillar, will need very different food than it does in its adult stage. We all know that kids are very finicky, very picky eaters, almost brats. If you think about it that way with the caterpillar, caterpillars eat only one particular kind of food. Atala butterflies will only eat kunti, monarchs only eat milkweeds, our, but our zebra butterflies only eat corky stem passion vines or passion vines. As adults, they expand their palate of foods and drink nectar from many flowers. You also wanna plant the food that birds and animals recognize as food. We'll get into that a little bit. We also wanna change our perspective and we wanna save the weeds. Oftentimes what we call weeds are critical and very important food for wildlife. Change our habits, become more sustainable. No pesticides, insecticides, fertilizers, go organic. Sadly, today in the news, we saw that there is another fish kill happening on Biscayne Bay. A lot of this is because of the overuse of fertilizers in our backyards, in golf courses. When we add fertilizer and it rains, that runs off into the sewers, into the drainage systems in the streets and ends up in the bay, which causes a proliferation of algae and a depletion of oxygen. Diversity brings diversity. The greater number of different species of plants you have in your yard, the more different types of birds and insects and native wildlife. We also wanna have protection from introduce predators. So plant the food that birds recognize as food. I love to travel. It's one of my favorite, favorite pastimes. But oftentimes when you travel, eating can be challenging. For example, these are escargots. For the French, they're delicious food. For a lot of people, no, they don't recognize this as food. Uh, if you go to Iquitos, uh, they might give you grubs and, you know, base it in coconut or tribe in Normandy. It's food, but it's not the food that we recognize as food. And we have to think about this when we are planting for wildlife. Uh, for example, one of my very good friends, Kirsten Hines, she lived off Key Biscayne, right next door to Bill Baggs Cape Florida State Park. And they had an incredible native wildlife garden and they saw an incredible diversity of birds. They were right next door to a state park that after Hurricane Andrew went through a great restoration from going from a monoculture, only Australian pines to having a huge diversity of native pines, uh, plants. My friends now live in Coconut Grove. Coconut Grove looks very green. It looks very lush. And even though their backyard is twice as big, maybe three times as big as it was in Key Biscayne, 
and they live in a very green neighborhood, they're not seeing the diversity of birds that they saw. What's the difference? The birds, the plants in Coconut Grove are not native, the majority. The birds do not recognize the plants that are there as food because they did not develop, they did not evolve over the thousands of years that our native birds did with the native plants. So talking about native plants, a native plant refers to a plant that was here before the Europeans came. These are plants that are adapted to our soil. They're adapted to our climate. They're adapted to our pollinators. They're adapted to our seed dispersers. They are also beautiful and sexy and create such a nice aesthetic plan to our, you know, to our backyard. The one on the left is a, one of my favorite plants. Uh, it is, uh, Sefa, oh, do, 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 do. I just forgot its name. I'll think of it in a second. Oh my goodness. Um, Calica, I'll think of it in a second. I am so sorry. So the Florida Native Plant Society advocates for the use of natives in our landscape. Once again, they conserve water. They're adapted to the conditions. So we, once they're established, you don't have to give them water. They're adapted to our wet and dry uh, seasons. They don't need fertilizers. So once again, by not needing fertilizers, they are going to prevent the fish kills that we're having in Biscayne Bay. And they provide habitat for pollinators and wildlife. So one of my favorite uh, natives is Beautyberry, Calicarpa Americana. Uh, it produces beautiful purplish red berries that birds love to eat. The flowers are also great for pollinators. And if you're studying botany, something very curious about this plant is that you can see the whole stage of development from the flower bud being closed to opening to the full flower being open, and then how it changes once pollinated into these beautiful berries. Here we have a beautiful black-throated blue warbler enjoying one of these beauty berries. They are edible to humans, not necessarily delicious, not a lot of flavor, lots of seeds, but the pioneers used to make jellies if they add a lot of water to them, not water, sugar. Uh, Psychotra nervosa, wild coffee. It's also uh, an amazing, amazing, amazing native plant to put to your backyard. When I was learning scientific names, the way that I remembered this one, if you drink too much coffee, you get psychotic and nervous, Psychotra nervosa. Uh, both the flower and the fruit provide for wildlife. This is a close relative. It's in the same family as the coffee we drink, but not close enough to yield anything that would resemble at all to the coffee that we drink. But if you do get one of the fruits and you take the seed, you will see that it looks like a little bitty, bitty, bitty coffee bean. Very good, birds love them. Another plant that I would strongly recommend for your backyard is firebush, Hamelia patens. And it provides food in two stages. The tubular flowers attract uh, hummingbirds and butterflies uh, with great nectar. And the berries, once again, great food for all kinds of birds, also for possums and raccoons. Gumbo limbo. Uh, one of my favorite trees, in fact, uh, Bursera was my first uh, email, Bursera at, I think it was excite.com, uh, Simaruba. Uh, in Spanish, they call it Indio Desnudo. They call it also the tourist tree. It has a red peely bark, um, very good for attracting bees and insect pollinators. It is one of the most common tropical hammock trees and king birds, fly catchers like to eat the fruit. It's also very sexy the way that it branches and it is a great tree to start um, living fence post. If you get a branch and stick it in the soil, you can start a tree just from that. The branching patterns won't be as pretty as if you started from seeds, but incredible tree and birds love it. Live oak. Corcus virginiana. One of the things that I love most about living in South Florida is that our diversity of trees mirrors our diversity of people. 
Live oak is a temperate tree. It grows all the way to Virginia. Gumbo limbo grows in Colombia, Cuba, Nicaragua, all of Central America. So we have the temperate and the tropical living together in one community as we do with people. Gumbo limbo is the number one bird diversity plan. It provides shelter and its beautiful, strong branches. Insects love to live on the branches. Epiphytes, orchids, bromeliads, um, ferns live on there. So by providing food, pollen, acorns, and incredible shade. Pigeon plum, Coccolova diversifolia, it's related to the sea grape. Another native, a small tree, uh, provides nectar for the large orange sulfur, Schwal's, uh, swallowtail, butterflies, pollen, and birds and other animals love to eat the fruit. We can eat the fruits from the sea grape, so I am pretty certain that these are also edible, not necessarily palatable. And I, so wild lime, Cephalosilum fragara, it's in the native, it's in the family of the citrus. It's also a great tree for your backyard. If you have an area, a fence where you don't want intruders to come in, we have a very low fence in uh, our property and I planted this there. It is also the host plant where the swallowtail butterfly lays her eggs. And what's really cool about this caterpillar is that it's the fence, it looks like bird poop. So, you know, a lot of birds love to eat caterpillars, but birds typically don't eat bird poop. And this caterpillar looks like bird poop. This is a very sexy uh, swallowtail butterfly. So when you want to establish a wildlife garden, things to remember is don't create monocultures. You know, wildlife likes diversity. We all like diversity. Also, not a very manicured yard. If you've ever been to Fairchild, Fairchild is beautiful, but everything is not trimmed like a square box. To me, it's almost embarrassing when I see a tree and it's trimmed to look like a lollipop. I often think about how embarrassed that tree must feel, uh, kind of like when a kid gets a bad haircut and is sent to school. Uh, you wanna allow for a more naturalistic, something looking more garden. And you wanna have a diverse lawn. Um, a lot of people strive to have that perfect green, lush, thick lawn with only grass growing in there. And they spend lots of money watering and fertilizing and cutting that grass and watering and fertilizing and cutting that grass. And all that fertilizer runs off into the bay and it's a desert. Nothing lives in that lawn because it's also sprayed with chemicals. If you allow the tiny wild flowers to creep into your lawn, it's still gonna look green. And those wild flowers are gonna create um, seeds for birds, nectar for wild for butterflies. Um, so my friends, Kirsten and Jim Cushlin, who created that book, Attracting Birds to South Florida, say, if you wanna attract birds, you have to become an insect farmer. And you have to change your perspective of how we see insects. Insects are not bad. Insects are bees and moths and butterflies and caterpillars and beetles. Ticks are actually arachnid. They belong to the, to the spider family. Uh, but insects are pollinators and insects are food for birds. You know, at Fairchild, at Fairchild, at Pelican Harbor, we have a huge problem that oftentimes we get raptors, we get owls and we get hawks that come in because they were poisoned. They were poisoned by mistake when people put out rat poison, the rat ate the poison and then the hawk or the owl ate the, um, the mouse. Well, we have similar issues. If you're putting pesticides on your plants and then a bird is going to eat that fruit or the bird is going to eat the insect that was just killed with a pesticide, we're inadvertently also poisoning the birds. And if you have spiders, I know Stephanie's not very fond of spiders, but if you have spiders in your yard, it means you're doing something good because you're attracting enough insects to feed these misunderstood creatures. One of the best ways to attract insects to your backyard is to plant a buttonwood, Conocarpus erectus. Buttonwood is one of our mangrove associate plants. 
It grows in many, many terrains adapted to our soil. Um, and it's very furrowed, furred bark is incredible to attract insects. It also makes for a very nice shade, shady tree, very beautiful branching pattern. And it supports beetles, flies, ants, moths, and so many different arthropods. Yeah. And insects are incredibly cool. Uh, these, I don't know if you've ever seen these, these are called thorn insects. And even naturalists like me sometimes make mistakes. Uh, my boyfriend had a house in plantation and we had planted a beautiful wild tamarind. And then I saw these thorn insects crawling on its branches. So what do you do? You Google it. And just like you should never Google your symptoms on anything because then you think you're gonna die. If you Google any insect, they're gonna tell you that it's the worst thing ever. So I got rid of these insects, I brushed them off and I wired them out. And when I got to Fairchild and I asked the team there, they're like, no, Kiki, those are actually not that bad. So leave the insects alone. They will find a nice balance and they will provide food for the birds. In fact, I found this very interesting article that our yards with non-native plants are creating food deserts for bugs and birds. When you put, again, it's not the food that birds and animals recognize as food. We don't want to create food deserts. And on top of that, we're poisoning whatever other animals are there. These are great pictures of our insect eating birds. Beautiful purple martin, sorry. We have an American kestrel, one of our smallest raptors enjoying a cricket, mockingbirds. Um, so things not to do. Don't plant invasive species. Don't annoy your neighbors. When I mean don't annoy your neighbors is as much as I love a lush, everglades-y looking background, I want to make sure that my neighbors are okay with my yard. So I trim a little bit more than I would if I lived close to the Everglades. Um, and many people live where they have homeowners associations. So there are certain parameters that you have to abide by. Don't use pesticides, herbicides, or fungicides. We know the majority of that is going to run off into the bay, and it's also going to kill the animals you're going to try to plant. Don't overplant. And I would say this is one of the biggest mistakes everyone does. When I first started getting into native plants, I was a student at FIU, and I could only afford it one or two plants at a time. And in a way that was a blessing in disguise because my parents' yard was not overplanted. Here, when you buy a plant, you're buying a one gallon plant or a three gallon plant, and it's maybe 12 inches wide. So you're gonna plant 10 of those without knowing that that plant is gonna grow to have a seven foot spread or a six foot spread. So don't overplant, give your plant space to grow. You can plant things in the meantime, in between, um, but don't overplant. And this is a very controversial, but don't allow cats or aggressive dogs in your garden. At the Seabird Station, I would say that cat attacks are maybe the third or the fourth biggest reason of why animals come in here. We have a lady, she is sweet as pie, but she comes in very often because the feral cat population she's feeding got another bird. And she has shown me videos of the cat climbing the tree, going by the nest. Cats make incredible indoor pets, not outside. Um, invasive species, the reason we don't wanna do this is because invasive species and a simulation that I say, how I compare it, is imagine a neighborhood and you have a playground and you have a park and the neighborhood kids are playing all night. If you have a gang of kids coming in, they're gonna push out the native kids. They're gonna push out the kids that were playing there and only the gang is gonna be there. Invasive species outcompete natives for space and they don't provide the food that the natives are used to. Uh, they just act like bullies, not good. And most of the time, you know, non-native species, you know, Many of them are invasive. Not all non-natives non are invasive. 
But some natives can also become invasive like cattails if you switch the quality of the water. Um, in fact, non-native species are the second biggest cause of extinction of species other than habitat destruction. So bringing non-natives into an environment is the second biggest cause of species going extinct. These are some very common non-native species that we find in backyards, a Brazilian pepper. It was brought in because it creates beautiful clusters of red berries. And these berries, birds and raccoons love to eat them. And then they spread, they poop the seeds everywhere. And Brazilian pepper grows like there is no tomorrow. Out competing native species for shade, for space. Um, it's incredible, it's horrible. Oyster plants. They're found in every neighborhood. Once again, they outcompete. Uh, natives, they don't provide habitat. Uh, the Chafalera umbrella tree was brought in because of these very, very cool flowers that it produces. Birds love to spread them, but they grow very quickly and outcompete natives for habitat. In fact, uh, Brazilian pepper and Chafalera are now illegal to plant. Lantana. Very sexy, very pretty. We do have a native lantana, and the problem we're having with lantana is that the non-native variety that is commonly sold in big box stores is hybridizing. It is mixing with the native species, and it does not provide the same quality of nectar and fruit. And then we're losing the genetic stock of the native species. Uh, snake plant, they call it mother-in-law's plant also, it creates huge thatches, huge patches, uh, outcompetes native plants. Um, to the right, we have the very pretty crab's eye or rosary pea. What, this is a climbing vine, was brought in because it's pretty. Birds spread the seeds. Uh, it is also extremely toxic and venom. Uh, if you eat it and you don't crack the seed, nothing happens, but apparently six of these can kill a horse. When I was studying plants, my botany professor said that a, lady, a girl was making a necklace out of it and she pricked herself with the needle and she died. It has, I think, abrin is the poison in there. But once again, this vine goes prolific. And this is where it gets controversy. Some of my most favorite volunteers at the Seabird Station also take care of cat colonies, but cats, are amazing indoor pets, but they are prolific hunters. And release, trap and release don't really work because one female cat that is left unspayed can have 16 kittens. It is incredible. Cats have caused extinction of bird populations in many islands. They're great predators, keep them indoors. Especially if you have a cat, if you cannot keep it indoors year round, keep it indoors when baby birds are learning to fly, when they're learning to fledge. Birds learn to fly from the ground up. Once they leave the nest, they'll be on the floor for a while. The mother and the father will be watching them and will be feeding them. I always say it's like little kids, when they're learning to walk, they're gonna fall. They're gonna be on the ground. But if there's cats around, the chances of those birds making it, it's few and far between. Cypress mulch, uh, it breaks my heart when I go into Home Depot and I see cypress being sold as the biggest mulch component because we are eradicating a beautiful South Florida, a beautiful ecosystem actually, cypress grows all the way up to North Florida. I am not a very religious person, but when I walk into a cypress dome, it's like walking into a cathedral that's full of orchids and bromeliad and birds that use it as a habitat. And for me to think that this is being used just to put on the ground as mulch is insane when there's alternatives. You can use recycled yard waste, your twigs, your branches. Um, at Fairchild, where they have so many beautiful plots, they're not buying cypress mulch. They get their mulch from tree trimmers that come and dump the trees they've trimmed out in the back of a Fairchild, and then that is used as mulch. That is what we use in our home also. We have the numbers of a couple of arborists 
we call them and they come and dump a whole bunch of mulch in our yard. We divide it with our neighbors. But if you want something that's a little bit more uniform, you can buy pine bark, melaleuca mulch, eucalyptus mulch, fallen leaves. They also sell uh, pine straw. Um, going about changing our ideas on weeds. Uh, we have all have seen this beautiful white little daisy, Biden's pilosa. People have a hate relationship with it because it grows extremely prolific, but it is the best pollinator plant available. Uh, bees love it. Butterflies love it. It is incredible. If we stop calling it a weed and call it a wildflower that you do have to maintain, I pull some of them out in parts of my yard and leave it some in another ones. Um, it's Latin name, Bidens, means two teeth because in the right you'll see the seeds and it has two little prongs that will attach to your socks or the fur of an animal to help it be dispersed. But it's a beautiful wildflower. Uh, this one, Phyla nodifera, it's also a frogweed. Uh, it grows as a great ground cover, better than lawn, providing nectar for the very, very small butterflies and tiny, tiny seeds that feed birds. So this is a property that Balaj and I bought about five years ago, and there was absolutely nothing there. My mom went into a depression when we bought it. My friends thought we should be buying something else. But five years later, it is a lush habitat. Uh, this is the same view of the cottage where we have an abundance of diversity of birds and butterflies that come and once again, things grow very quick in Florida. Don't overplant. Um, so, if you planted, they will come. This is one of the great telltale stories of the Atala butterfly. Uh, the Atala butterfly I mentioned earlier only lays her eggs on kuntis, on cycads. And the cycad was becoming extinct because of habitat development and because of over harvesting to make arrowroot flour. Well, in the late 80s, early 90s, a small population of Atalas was found in Crandon Park. And people started planting more and more kuntis, butterfly gardens in schools, butterfly gardens in people's yards, and more and more of these kuntis were planted. They were planted under the metro rail, creating a wildlife corridor. And I planted kuntis in my yard five years ago and nothing until this summer where I started to see a tala butterflies finally come to my backyard. My backdoor neighbor uh, was a teacher who participated in the Fairchild Challenge with Fairchild and she has Kuntis. And between her and I, we have a good population of Kuntis. And now we have these beautiful Atala caterpillars that turn into butterflies. In life, we know that red means danger, don't eat me. Uh, the toxin that the Atala has, that the Kunti has, goes into the caterpillar and the butterfly. So if a bird or a lizard or something eats these uh, caterpillars or butterfly, they are going to feel like they have a hangover. They're going to be nauseated and they're going to remember what that caterpillar looked like and they're never, ever, ever going to eat another one again. Um, these are some of the resources that I strongly recommend. Attracting Birds to the South Florida Gardens uh, by my friend Kirsten Hines and Jim Cushlin. And I, we have some of these for sale at at Pelican Harbor. Florida Native Plant Society strongly encourage everyone to become a member. They have great resources on putting the right plant in the right place for your native garden. Natives for your neighborhood is an incredible webpage that if you put your zip code in there, it will tell you what plants were originally found in your neighborhood. So it helps you recreate the type of habitat that you had. 
And this is Bound by Beauty, uh, another great resource on saving when we save butterflies, you know, to save ourselves. It's just a web page full of happiness, great resources, encouraging neighbors to come together and create these wildlife corridors to bring wildlife back into the environments into which we live. And this is the Atala butterfly that I mentioned, you know, that is now in my backyard after five years. It's a butterfly that almost went endangered, but thanks to people like you who are interested in establishing native wildlife gardens in your backyard, this butterfly had a crop year today in Miami-Dade County. And I will take, these are some of the ways you guys can follow us online. Uh, we're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and of course, our webpage. And, and I'll take any questions or comments. There were a couple questions in the chat that I can um, kind of read off. Yes, please. The first one I saw was, how can you tell the difference between native firebush and non-native firebush? So... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and we're having a lot of challenges, not only with firebush, but porterweed and lantana. The porterweed is also hybridizing. The native porterweed, which is very short, is hybridizing with the native one. Uh, from what I know, the native flower is all red. The non-native has yellow and red in the flower. That's one of the tails. Probably the one they saw at Home Depot. It's not the native. Uh, to get the native uh, firebush, I would definitely go when Tropical Audubon Society is having their native plant sales. Uh, once a year, the Native Plant Society has a huge plant sale in different parts. Citizens for Better South Florida also has a native nursery. And I will, on this one, at the, I will share with everyone who's here today, I will share a list of native plant nurseries that can pretty almost guarantee you that you're putting the native one. But yeah, it's getting harder and harder with a lot of things hybridizing. Is there another question in there? Yes, there was another question that said, I have an enormous amount of lizards. Is that good? Yeah, it could be good. Um, so, Florida, because of our amazing climate, we have a huge number of non-native lizards. The brown and all that we see everywhere, that one's not native, that one has outcompeted our native little green and all. Uh, birds love to eat lizards. So yes, you know, so uh, lizards are great because birds like to eat them, but birds also, lizards also eat butterflies. So it's a challenge, you know, we brought in a lot of non-native lizards and they outcompete our native ones. Um, Fernando said, I have many insects, animals and birds in my yard, even saw hummingbirds in my fire plant. What can I do about the spiders that make a mess around all the windows and around the outside doors without doing anything bad to them? I would, if you, if you don't like the spiders allow around your windows, get a broom and gently, you know, move them away. Um, but yes, spiders are part of the ecosystem. A lot of birds love to eat them. And they're also great at capturing mosquitoes. And if you get up early in the morning and see the web of a golden orb weaver that create gold silk with the dew drops in there, you know, they're beautiful. So I would just gently, you know, move them out of the way. Awesome. Um, I think that's everything I have in the chat as far as questions. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. And planting gardens, it's something what's beautiful is that they're not static. They're always evolving. You know, my garden from this year looks very different from the garden of last year. And something that is beautiful is that you will see things starting to introduce themselves because now I have trees. I am seeing baby oak trees starting to grow in my backyard. It's not big enough to sustain a baby oak tree. So I might have to put it in a little pot and plant it somewhere else. Uh, 
but the birds are eating the seeds, you know, and then standing in branches and then pooping seeds somewhere else. And there is recruitment, just like in Cape Florida, Bill Bag State Park, you know, after the restoration, that has become a major stopping point for birds migrating to the Caribbean and Central America and all those birds who stop in other people's backyards and then poop the little seeds here and there. They are seeing plants that were not planted during the restoration, but that the birds are recruiting. Uh, establishing a native garden takes a little bit of planning, uh, takes some time, um, and it is very hard to dictate, you know, plant this, don't plant that. But with looking at the resources of natives for your neighborhood, bound by beauty, going to native plant nurseries, and it doesn't, you don't have to be a purist. It is okay to put other things that are non-native in there, as long as they're not invasive. Um, but it is so fulfilling to sit in a yard and hear mockingbirds and see butterflies that you waited five years for them to come. And they finally did. Uh, both the neighbors on either side of my property have thanked me for the butterflies that are now in their backyards. So I think it is our responsibility, not only to rehabilitate sick, injured and orphan native wildlife that like we do at Pelican Harbor, but also to provide habitat because in a way, you know, all of our houses are where their houses used to be. So if we can restore and recreate and give them a safe environment as they either live here year long or as they are migrating, you know, north or south, but it's rewarding. And I hope you learned something today. Uh, there's so much, there's so much still to learn, you know, but we're lucky in South Florida where we have things from up north and things from the Caribbean all coexisting, you know, in one beautiful community. So I will stay if anyone wants to hang out or. Yeah, I have a couple more that came in the chat. Oh, yeah. um, Joyce asked, uh, she has a lot of dragonflies. Is that a good thing? It's fabulous. They're beautiful. As far as I know, there's no invasive dragonflies and they are delicate flying helicopters, you know, mm -hmm. that birds love to eat and they eat mosquitoes. So the more dragonflies you have in your backyard, the less mosquitoes you're gonna have. We need as many of those as possible. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, Alexandria asked if bird feeders are okay to use. Controversial. Uh, controversial. I think the best bird feeders you can do is plant the plants that produce the food that birds recognize as food. Uh, because with hummingbird bird feeders, if you are not meticulous with that, that water is going to ferment, turn into alcohol or grow bacteria, and then you're going to be in a way feeding bad stuff to the, to the hummingbirds. Birds see, if you're feeding bird seeds, uh, a lot of them are very fatty, you know, and it's like putting snacks of potato chips and cookies, you know, for the birds rather than the most nutritious. So yes, uh, especially with painted buntings, if you're putting the right kind of seed and you're keeping them clean, so they're not fermenting, but then you're also attracting squirrels. I just thought of a funny antidote um, and it's a challenge we have in South Florida. You always have to plant enough for three. If you have fruit trees, you have to plant enough for yourself, for the thief and for wildlife, like mangoes and avocados. You know, yes, we have a mango tree and the squirrels get to it. So you wanna make sure that you have enough for three. We heard a very sad story of someone putting poison out for the squirrels because the squirrels were eating the, you know, the mangoes. So if you're going to plant a fruit tree, know that you're also going to have wildlife that are going to enjoy from it. So I, yeah, go ahead. I wanted to share um, an anecdote. Um, Kiki, I don't know if you had a chance to read this story, but it's a little bit sad, but it was also, I felt like important to share um, one of our awesome volunteers who did intake for us, meaning she answered the phone and helped coordinate rescues. Um, she responded to a call of a gentleman that was 
um, in a little bit of a panic because he found a woodpecker that was hanging almost upside down from a cavity in a palm tree. Um, it was some kind of tree that looked like a palm tree, but it was an invasive plant. Um, and so they needed a ladder and our volunteer went out with the ladder. They climbed up there. And what happened is the, the inside, the trunk of this tree or this plant, it grows almost like webby, um, very fibrous. And the woodpecker was trying to make a cavity for its nest. And what happened is that as it was pecking and it went inside, when it came to come out, the fiber had wrapped around its neck and its feet. And it couldn't actually leave the cavity. It was kind of hanging out of there. Sorry if you hear my pups in the background. Um, and so they were able to get the bird out of the situation, but it had been in that situation for so long that it shortly passed away um, from having been hung upside down from the fiber. So I think it's also important to remember, like the reason native plants are so important is because they're meant to be for the birds that we have here or the wildlife that we have here. Um, so it was a sad story, but I think it was really impactful and kind of teaching about native plants and native wildlife. And Stephanie, absolutely. And what you're saying, what we are so fortunate in South Florida that we have such a huge diversity, you know, of native plants that represent both the north and the south. You go up north and their native plant trees are like very, very thin. Our native plant trees are like books are thick because we have so much to choose from. And I think the more people that are planting natives, the more that we're demanding natives, you know, from, from our box stores and also from our municipalities, that every community, when you establish a house, X percent of your yard should be native, you know, and encouraging people, you know, to be careful with the pesticides, with the fertilizers that they use. Um, with we're not I don't know how we're ever going to change this one you know but the kitty cats and the garbage you know that you put out there but planting the plants that birds and animals recognize as food uh giving yourself time you know you don't have to buy something that's huge things grow very quick in South Florida uh plant a design I am always here and available and happy to answer any questions dealing with plants. And if I don't know, I can definitely guide you in the right direction. But having a yard, we, in the property that I have, we have an Airbnb and we get so many comments from the guests that they sit there having their morning coffee, seeing birds and butterflies, you know, in there, it's just rewarding. And it makes you happy that, you know, you gave an animal a stopover to feed their bellies and to rest, you know, on their way south, on their way back, back north. But, and we're happy that in our new property, uh, we're also going to have, you know, a native gardens to create habitat for all the migratory animals and all the, you know, local resident animals and to teach people how sexy and beautiful a native plant garden can be. Okay, I have one more question. Um, Kiara asked, uh, I'm in South Miami. I get several parrots or parakeets. Are they, is it okay to feed those? If yes, what do they like? Aye, aye, aye. So parrots are not native. Uh, we have a huge population from escaped from the pet trade. And I think parrots just love to eat a diversity of fruit. Uh, you know, the, the more fruit you can give them and maybe seeds, but I would look into a little bit more as to what do parrots eat. Um, but I know they eat nuts and fruits and healthy stuff, you know, but I know that when I used to work at a vet, we had issues with parrots that came in when they only ate seeds, they had very fatty livers. And sadly, a lot of people wanting to do good, feed wildlife the wrong thing. You know, even though we don't advocate people feeding Muscovy ducks, when people feed ducks bread, it's not healthy for them, you know, or rice. So the more, just like with humans, you know, the more nutritious food you eat, the same thing for wildlife, you know, the more refined breads and refined rice, not good for anyone, not good for you, not good for wildlife. Oh, well. How cute parrots. Well, thank you everyone for being here. What's our next one, Stephanie? Our next one is, it's on October 13th um, with the Florida Manta Girl and it's the mysterious manta rays of Florida. 
Um, so she studies manta rays and um, you might follow her on Instagram. Um, so really excited for that one. I hope you guys sign up for that one again. Um, we'll have this recording up by Friday. Um, so we try to get them up as soon as we can. Um, I want yeah. to give a shout out to our, we have a couple of volunteers who are here. Uh, Gregory is one of our new, new volunteers and Alexandra helps us with Operation Rescue and Release. Uh, Judith was started as a volunteer and is an amazing grant writer. So thank you. And thank you all, because the truth is we could not do the work we do at Pelican Harbor Seabird Station without every one of you. All of you are part of our rescue team, from the person who makes a phone call to the Uber driver, to the person taking the phone call. And if it was not for people who care like you, these animals would not survive. You know, they would basically be dead on arrival. So yeah. we give so many animals a second chance to you. Tell your friends about us and come and visit us either for a self-guided tour or for a guided tour. And we love you all and wish you health and goodness. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. <laughs>